Hey, everybody, and welcome to A Tatter Effect here at the Girls, Inc. studio in Las Vegas. Thank you for tuning in today, hanging out with us. Man, well, it's Friday, and what a week. (laughs) I wonder if everybody else has had a work week like this. We had a crazy work week. Well, it kind of started last week with the filming or a couple of weeks ago with the filming wouldn't you say um willow and olivia yes and it carried over into this week hell week (laughs) (laughs) more so for you this week willow um i don't know i think we've i think it's been like hell week for all of us at different points so just a clue uh you in that that's listening so you know what we mean is i'm speaking at the arizona conference i'm speaking on eyeliner so i had to have a video um and so willow Olivia and I thought, we, we got this. We've got all these cameras for the podcast. We've got great mics and audio. We've got this. And we have filmed some other things, some, some other uh, procedures. Um, but I don't think there's anything like trying to film an eyeliner. It was hard. Was it not hard, Olivia? Yeah. It was hard. I think because the eye, <clears throat> it's like sunken into the face. So it creates a lot of shadows. There's already shadows and then you are adding shadows with your hand when you're getting in to do the procedure. Yeah, exactly right. Cause I, and I think like you, you forget that, like every time my hand is there or, you know, like the artists themselves create shadows with their stretch hand, their machine. Um, and that's just more creating more shadows on top of shadows that are there organically like the eyebrow i think was a little bit easier because it sits up on the forehead out 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 of a canyon you know a, a dip yeah. if you will that eye is in a dip the so pushes it up a little bit yeah so it was really hard and <clears throat> you know i want these up close you know zoomed in shots so they can see that needle going into the skin and so your frame is really small and you know the minute I rotate the eye she's out of frame that eyeballs like out of frame or it's you know almost out of frame so you have to keep stopping and and adjusting and that's really really hard and then to get the audio and I think the first eyeliner we filmed everything that could go wrong including the power going out that day (laughs) went wrong in including the trash guy coming and emptying the dumpsters outside, which was so loud, right? The electricity went off. We had lots of technical difficulties. This was us filming your eyeliner, Olivia. Yeah. yeah. And we were down a person. So yeah. We just felt and struggling. Yeah, we were down a person because she was getting her eyeliner well, tattooed. I mean, in a way, we're down two people because you were also the one tattooing her. <laughs> yeah, right? Because I'm oftentimes behind the camera helping produce and, and, um, and, and you know, focus and with the camera angle. So, yeah, we were really down like two people. But God love you, Olivia. You were trying. You were trying <laughs> with swollen, tearing eyes. I mean. No glasses uh, on. No yeah. glasses. I saw you looking around, trying to. Yeah, what can I do? What can I do? But it was it was funny. So so that 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 filming, and we were stressed, but we got through it without killing each other. We really did. I felt like Willow was gonna walk out. I thought Willow was <laughs> gonna be like, "I'm done, guys. Bye. <laughs> no more filming. No more no. filming." No. <laughs> and did you have your new cat shoes on that day? I did. And you I'm, did. That was actually another thing that was wrong. Um, <laughs> the, the, I got sounds of my shoes in the background of the audio, so I had to go in and clip out me stepping yeah, when, the, like, you could hear me. Yeah, you have to denoise that, yep. which meant a lot of editing, because you are the one who does the editing, yes, you and only you. And and um, and let's just let's just put it out there for our listeners that you have proclaimed uh, many many times on many occasions to Olivia and I and God knows who else how much you love editing. So just you know hold on to that thought. <laughs> listeners um so anyway we got through we got through your um your filming olivia and then we put it up and it was good 
we, you know, a, 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 a Willow edited it. We watched it. It was good. It was good. I think Kat gave it like an eight. And I, 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 I did not. I did not. And nothing to do with you, Olivia. <laughs> you look great laying there. And you like sucked it up. You were a great model. Yeah, and it probably took us six hours to do a 35-minute touch eyeliner because we're filming. <laughs> so you were like a trooper. And it had nothing to do with Will. I thought, I thought we did really good. Um, but I wasn't happy. So, well, it's not that I wasn't happy. If that's what I had to use, I would have been happy. And it would have worked just fine. I think my audience would have liked it and thought it was very well done. But me, the type of person I am, um, <laughs> I always want to try to do better. I always feel I, I, we can do better because we learn a lot. We learned a lot about angles on that particular set. Um, so we get one of our apprentices. <laughs> we sucker her into laying down uh, six hours for a 40 minute eyeliner tattoo. And so it was great to have both of you behind the cameras, but a few, but still technical difficulties. Audio, I forgot to put my mic on during one segment. Um, <laughs> And I, I think, did, I think you blamed, did, did, I think you threw Olivia under the bus for that, Willow. Just I yesterday, mean, I think you did. So <laughs> I think you did. I think you did. It took you a week to do. I think you've been holding it in all this time. You know, finally. <laughs> but so the audio, we just had that little clip of the audio. And then, you know, the Ninja, our recording device, kind of looped audio on another segment. And there was a few spots where the camera angle wasn't great starting out, but then we corrected it. And so, yeah, that video came out a lot better than our first attempt, I thought. We had different camera angles, better camera angles. Um, I still think we can do better because we even learned from this one. The camera angles were a lot better, but now we know exactly where to put a light and how to move the camera slightly so I think the next one we film is going to be even better. But Willow, I needed this this uh, next week for Scottsdale uh, on stage. And so, yeah, I was like, you need to be obsessed and you got to get this done. It's next week. Oh, my God. So you spent, what, three days, like all day long editing? Yeah, at, least, yeah. at least three. Yeah. I watched that video fully through with audio four times and then yeah. without audio once. So I, it's, it, it's very good content. Well, you know. I've been told that I have a nice, you know, studio voice. You do. I, I am grateful for that. You have a nice recording voice. So, like, it wasn't like I was going crazy from that. So. Like, you have to listen to a loud, screeching voice that, like, can give you a headache at the end. I know. Um, and it was our very own Felicia. But I understand. Editing, editing, well, you know, it can be, it can be repetitive and um, monotonous and redundant. It's over and over and over. Because you got you to gotta clip out all... I, I call it trash. You got to clip out all the, the the trash and the, you know the noise and the you know and everything and get a nice clean video while leaving all the tattooing in or at least as much of the tattooing as in as possible. I don't like highly edited procedure videos where they montage through you know a lot of it. So anyway, so uh, you finished that for me yesterday and yesterday I think you proclaim. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you proclaimed it, but I think you hinted that you no longer like editing. And so Olivia and I had to remind you that, you know, you have professed your undying love for editing. And so, you know. We're just going through a little bit of a rough patch, me and editing right now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a good video and I'll be right back to loving it. I know, <laughs> but you're going to Scottsdale with me. Yes, and so, I'm very excited to see that. On, on screen on the big on, screen yeah. and I think you're gonna be super proud because it's am. it it really took uh, a, a three team besides the model I mean a four team effort right we don't want to forget our our great models you Olivia and Felicia because it really does take a great model that's patient that trusts us trusts the process and is patient because um, like I said it can take like six to eight hours to really properly film one procedure that normally takes you know, 30 to 45 minutes. Um, well, that's what an eyeliner takes me. Anyway, on, on in normal circumstances. But, uh, you know, you, Willow, and, and Olivia, and, and myself, um, 
Well, I, I guess I was the actor in in the um, right. Mm -hmm. So what Felicia and you were the muse, and uh, I was the actor, and then you two were the producers and the editors. You know, the filmers, producers, editors. Yeah, the audio technicians, all that stuff. So I think we did a great job. I think we did too. Yeah. And so what are we doing tonight, Willow? We're going out to dinner to celebrate. Yes. <laughs> I'm taking the whole team out, the admin team out. We're going for sushi and we're going to have some cocktails and we're going to celebrate this week. So anyway, yeah, sometimes it was an exhausting, exhausting couple of weeks. But I will say I love the video and she was a little juicy. It wasn't easy skin, but we ended up with a great eyeliner on her I'm, I'm going to be super proud to present it I think my audience is going to love it it will go on the new Girls Inc Academy eyeliner course that I'm working on currently so all right <clears throat> let's move on so I wanted to talk about the client experience uh, we talk a lot about procedures um, needles color you know we, we talk a lot about about things that have to do with procedures. And I've also talked a lot about uh, motivational stuff, law of attraction, entrepreneurial stuff. And I haven't, we, we have talked about client stuff, but today I thought it would be interesting to dive a little bit deeper and, um, and talk about that. I, I think there's a lot of newbies that do have a lot of questions when it comes to clients and I wonder if some, you know, new technicians, new hairdressers, new, you know, what it, estheticians or lash girls, whatever your, your, um, whatever it is that your, whatever your service is, I'm wondering if you're so focused on doing the best service possible that maybe you don't think in depth about the client experience because the client experience isn't only about the procedure and getting a great procedure or great service. Yes, that's probably first and foremost. You got to do a great procedure. You got to do a great service. They got to love it. It's got to look fantastic. But there's also the overall client experience. So when clients first make contact with you, like the very first contact a client has, with you who answers the calls the emails the messages how how does the client contact you first and foremost do you have a website is it by email only do you is it a phone number do you allow facebook messages do you you know go back and forth with clients on facebook messages on instagram in your dms do you allow clients to contact you and make appointments or ask questions through all those platforms, website, email, phone. I think I forgot to mention phone. I mean, we do still have phones. You can still pick up a phone and call your, the studio or call the artist or technician. Instagram, Facebook Messenger. I mean, that's a lot of different uh, inboxes to manage and to check every single day uh or multiple times a day so i would say that's the first thing to think about how do you want your clients to contact you if you're fine with them using all those different avenues of inboxing that's great if you're not then decide which platforms you're going to set up for client contact uh, here at the girls inc studio it's too much for us. We like to condense things down to email and phone for clients per se. Uh, we do every now and then get some, D would you say we get some DMs and some Facebook messages, Olivia? Yeah, but we usually forward them to email. We forward them to call. email. Yeah, I think, I think it's, you can stay much more mm -hmm. organized in an email. You can yeah. make folders and um, you can tag your emails and there's software to um, prioritize your emails, which is something we're looking into right now and going to be implementing. So we're, we're email and of course we, we do highly welcome phone calls. We have a front desk, so we welcome phone calls. 
So if you have a front desk and that front desk person is your scheduler, they are the first point of contact for your clients, not you, the artist or the technician. So it's important to have a scheduler or a front desk girl that is really friendly. And I would say patient, (laughs) really patient, right? Because it can be, uh, well, you know, we love our clients, but some clients require patience. I'm just going to leave it at that. Yeah. Um, so I think it's really important that, you know, who, whoever your first point of contact is, if it's not you, that they have a really nice friendly voice and, you know, they're patient, they're helpful, they, they, they enjoy working with the public. And they enjoy customer service because there's a lot of questions. Sometimes that first point of contact isn't to book an appointment per se. It is to ask questions and kind of feel you out. Sometimes it's just, yeah, what's your price? And you tell them your price, thank you, bye. So sometimes it's just, you know, price searching. They just want to know how much you charge. Um, But a lot of times it's, it's they have questions. They have questions. They may have questions about you, the, the products you use, um, some procedural questions, things like that. So if you have a front desk, I think it's a really good idea to have a list of questions, <clears throat> you know, all written out uh, for your front desk to use. And we have that at the Girls Inc. Studio. We have that. We have a few different documents with lots of info on there. So no matter what the client is asking or needing or uh, wanting, our front desk can go to different uh, documents with that info already all listed out for them to recite or, or uh, copy and paste. So I think that's, that's important. And, it's, and what it does is it keeps, that keeps the information uniform you know, so, you know, every client is getting the same, the same answer. It's a uniform answer because sometimes you go through front, you switch front desk, front desk girls and schedules, um, or, or that front desk girl maybe is on vacation or sick and you have someone stepping in, someone else on your team stepping in. Um, and it also is a time saver. It's just, it's efficient rather than having to, you know, uh, you know, go look for an answer or get up and go ask someone, you know, for what, what the answer is, because your schedule is not going to know all the answers, uh, maybe after they've been there for a very, very long time, but it's just good to have that stuff written down and, and handy for your front desk. <clears throat> if you do not have a front desk and I did not for 13 years, you guys, for 13, my first 13 years of my career, I did not have a front desk person. It was just me. It was me, myself, and I. So, and I think a lot of you can relate to that. Um, you know, you, you work all day seeing clients. I, I would see anywhere from five to seven clients a day. And then all the calls would come in to, to my phone. And yes, my personal cell phone, which I no longer recommend. Um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. You learn a lot when you open up your own studio, you start getting a front desk, you get a, a designated work phone, you, you, you learn a lot. But I, I, I made a lot of those, I don't want to call them mistakes. Um, I did a lot of things, I guess, back in the day that caused me more work. And if I knew back then what I knew now, uh, I, I would have done things differently much earlier on in my career. But you know, is you know, but you learn. It's a, it's it's a process, and and a lot of this information wasn't ready uh, readily available in online courses. There wasn't really coaching back then. There wasn't a lot of that uh, available as it is today. So, you work all day. You're seeing clients. So if you're seeing clients, especially if you're seeing clients back to back to back, as I was, I barely had a lunch break. You can't answer your phone. You just can't answer your phone. So that day, all incoming client, you know, calls would go to voicemail. I would end my day 
around six or seven o'clock at night. And then if, you know, if I didn't have a headache, if I, if I felt motivated, I would stay another hour and I would start playing my voicemail and I would be writing down all the messages, their names and phone number and a quick little note on why they were calling. And then the next day I would get up and I would start doing return calls if I felt like it. Sometimes you wake up the next day and you got an early nine o'clock eyebrow and you're going again all day long. So to make a long story short or to get to the point, there were some days, you guys, that back then I would go three days and not call back clients just because I was so busy tattooing them and servicing them in person that I just didn't really have the time to do daily calls. And looking back on that, you know, I, I, I should have done better. I should have, I should have been doing better. Um, you know, I could have lost some clients and who knows, maybe, maybe I did. Maybe some clients got, fu- I certainly had some clients get frustrated, call me twice you know, just reminding me that they're waiting for a return call. And that's a little embarrassing, but that's the way I, that's the way I, you know, rock and rolled back then. Um, and, and it was difficult and it was, and it was stressful. So if that's you, then consider getting a virtual secretary, you know, who, who, I, I don't know if that term was even around back then. I mean, you're talking, this is, I've had my own studio in a front desk now for eight, nine years, almost nine years. So it's been, it's been a minute, but you know, so you're talking nine years ago and then for 13 years, for 13 years straight, you know, I, I, I wished I had, I wished I had, you know, hired a virtual secretary, you know, just to work a couple hours a day. And it's affordable, you guys. So if if you can't afford, if your budget is not allowing you to have like a full-time front desk girl, someone that actually comes into your studio, or maybe you don't have a studio yet. I didn't. I worked 13 years, almost 13 and a half years uh, in a room in a salon. I didn't have a front desk. I didn't have a team. It was just me. And... And, um, and I just saw clients all day and I, t- and I trained and I lectured and, you know, did all that, that, that fun stuff. But I, I wished I had, um, you know, hired a virtual secretary. I wish I had spent some money on doing that. That probably would have relieved me a lot of stress and it would have been uh, super helpful and beneficial to me. So just think about that. If you're, if you're super stressed out and, and you just feel like, I just can't get back to these calls and get them booked, you know, and then, and then getting them booked, that's another whole thing, right? The schedule book, that's another whole thing, another whole topic that we're going to have to talk on another podcast because balancing, you know, new procedures where you're making income with touch-ups where many of you don't charge for your touch-ups. So zero income, it's like this balancing act because your week's got to average out. You can't have a week of all free touch-ups, um, but you got to get those touch-ups in. You cannot neglect them and you know push them down the road because you want to fit in paying appointments. Um, that's not really fair to the client. So it is this whole balancing act. So the schedule book, that can take time in trying to figure out you know, uh, client schedules and, you know, a lot of times they're getting ready for vacation or they can't do this day, they can't do that day. So once you get a client on the phone, it's, it's not like 30 seconds or a minute and you're done. Sometimes you're on the phone with a client for, you know, five to 10 minutes. And, you know, me sometimes with, you know, my little ladies, you know, that I love to death, it could be a 20 minute phone call because they want to tell me, you know, about their whole week or, or something, you know, they like chatting and, uh, and I'm a chatter. So yeah. So virtual secretary, just consider it. If you're at a place where you're busy with the clients and getting back to clients, the callbacks, the scheduling, it's starting to really annoy you. It's starting to really cause problems or it's, it's, you know, affecting your weekend time, your family time, start to stress you out. Virtual secretary, or maybe you're ready to move into a studio 
Maybe you're ready for that, or maybe that's right around the corner, right? A lot of you listening is probably right around the corner. That's probably in your horizon. Um, so, okay. So that's the first point of contact, those incoming calls. People wanting to talk to you, wanting to, wanting to schedule. The booking process. Is your booking process, is it well-oiled, easy, and simplified? You know, some of you, probably so, and some of you, it's probably not. Uh, so you have to think about your booking process. Once a client decides on you, how do they book? Um, do you require them to come in for an in-person consultation? You know, because that's... that. Then you got to book them for a consult. Is the consult free? Do you charge for the consult? And then if they book the procedure, you apply the consultation fee to the price of the procedure. I only have consultations come in person for removal, corrections, and uh, removal, corrections, and areolas. Other than that, brand new eyebrows, brand new... Uh, eyeliners, I do not. I do not have them come in. Uh, lips, brand new lip, I do, because I want to look at that that tissue in the undertone of the lip. So you got to think about that. Do you do your consultation in person, or do you do your consultations via email, online? Do you have them send you in pictures and then have a list of uh, questions that could affect? them getting tattooed at this time. Like, are they on Accutane? Are they on uh, antibiotics? Or do they have lash extensions on? Have they been in the sun? Do you have a whole list of questions that you email them for the answer yes or no? And then do you require them to send you in pictures? So, you know, because some artists like to consult with all appointments before they actually book them for the procedure. Some do, some don't. I'm, like I said, I will do brand new eyebrows and lips. Um, I send them a set of questions and I don't necessarily need to see pictures. I just, I just have them come in uh, and we do the procedure as long as they didn't check anything on that list of questions. And then I have a few other procedures, as I mentioned earlier, that I do want them to come in for an in-person consult. I personally don't charge for a consultation. Um, but some people do, and that's, um, that's up to you. That's something that you have to uh, consider and decide, uh, as a part of your, your, your policy and how you're going to run your business. When your clients are ready to book, do you have, do you offer online booking? Is it on your website or do they have to call? Uh, how do you do that? We just launched a new website with online booking and we love it. Our clients love it. So, but it is, it is, it, it's, it costs money. You know, it's additional fees, additional expenses. Uh, but they say online booking increases bookings on average about 15%. Some people are looking through your website. They're right there in the moment. They, they're excited. They want to book. Bam, they hit the button. And they now have an appointment with you. Um But we have other uh, processes set up to ensure they're going to be a good client. Uh, We uh, take a deposit. All that is um, automated. So, you know, you have have to get those things in place. Um, You know, so I don't know. You know, there's lots of things to think about, especially when you're a new artist. And some of these things that I'm mentioning like as uh, are, are more expensive there's more fees involved and sometimes when you're a new artist or you're just getting into your new studio every penny counts and so these might be things that you want to Im- implement but they're just not fitting the budget right now but as you go uh you can start implement implementing them one at a time so when you do book clients, do you, uh, do you require a deposit? You know, some people require a deposit, some people don't. We do here at Girls Inc. We require a deposit. Um, what if the client makes a stink? 
about having to pay a deposit? Do you waive it? We don't. And we do get clients that make a stink. You know, they get upset that they have to pay a deposit. But I think deposits keep no-shows down. The, uh, every now and then, I think Michonne had one two weeks ago, uh, and she had paid a deposit. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. And she no-showed. So it's, the no-shows will still happen, but it does cut them down uh, tremendously because we do not refund that money. And we don't call it a deposit. It's called a booking fee. If you title it deposit, deposits are refundable. Technically, legally, you have to refund it. But if you title it a booking fee, fee. It's a fee. This is not a deposit. This is a fee we charge you to get into our schedule. Uh, and if you no show, you do not get that fee back. So if they call and they want to schedule again, you know, they apologize. I understand you keep the, the, you're keeping the booking fee and they want to schedule again. Do you charge them another booking fee? What do you think about that, Olivia? Yes. And I know some of the girls here even charge them the entire procedure, mm -hmm. depending on, like, their no, no shows. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yes. Charge them another booking fee. And this, and these booking, do these booking fees, does the second, does it all go towards the price of the procedure? Yes. Yes. So it's not like you're making a booking fee on top of the procedure fee. Um, we're not gouging clients and, uh, you know, w we just want them to show up, you know, because we, we book two hours. Some of you girls using the single needle are booking three and four hours out of your book to do one client. So when you have that reserved out of your day and you're counting, we count on that income. I can remember how important, not, it's not, not that it's still not important to me today because I still see clients, but years and years ago when I first started and I was broke, I was absolutely broke and had no money in every procedure, you know, it was paying a bill, it was buying my groceries and I lived procedure to procedure to procedure, you know, that's when you know, th those hours that, that you have reserved out of your book become, you know, critical, critical to your well-being and critical to, you know, um, staying afloat, you know, f financially. So you really depend on those clients showing up, doing the service and earning that income. And when they don't show up, you know, it hurts. It can, it can hurt, you know, financially and, and you know, and, and, and it's emotional and maybe even a little mental, you know, you get really upset. Um, so yeah, so charge, I think, I think, I think it's important to charge a booking fee. And then if they don't show up and they want to schedule again, you charge another booking fee or as Olivia mentioned, we have a couple artists in here that will just say, well, if you want to get back in my book, then you have to pay the balance. So the full procedure is paid in advanced before that artist will reschedule them. And so I think that's fair. So, you know, either charge them another additional booking fee or just charge them the entire procedure. You charge them the entire procedure, they're going to show up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I had a dancer. This is a funny story, but I had a dancer out here, an exotic dancer. And she was notorious. Worked on her for years and years. And she was notorious for booking. I did her eyebrows. And then just not showing did it to me constantly to the point where I told him I'm not taking her I'm not taking her anymore this is before I required deposits this is years ago um when I didn't have a lot of policies in place and and I I, I told him I'm not gonna work on you anymore you know show me all the time so she came in and she wrote me a check this is back when people wrote checks <laughs> wrote me a check for the full procedure and got in my book and do you, and so I'm like, okay, she's going to show up. She paid for the whole procedure. Do you know she didn't show up? <laughs> she didn't show up. So then she calls. I'm so sorry. 
you know, and um, so, you know, I want to get back in your book and I'll drop off a check for the full procedure again. Or can you just run a credit card? And I said, no, I got a credit card machine. So I ran her credit card for the full procedure. And do you know she didn't show up? Oh my God. Yeah, no, I'm not kidding. <laughs> I am not, you could not make this up. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. And do you know, so the third time she calls, I ran a credit card. So you're talking, this is like 400 bucks for eyebrows back then. And she calls the third time and runs her car. And she, well, first she says, I'm so sorry. Are you mad at me? I'm like, oh, hell no. I'm not mad at you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, this is this has been working out fantastic for me. I mean, I do sit around waiting like 20 minutes or so. And I always did book her at the end of the day. That was the other deal we had. So if, so in the midst so of she didn't. So so because if it was in the middle of the day and she didn't show up, then I got two hours in the middle of my day. You know, it's yeah. like, ugh. Right, but it, at the end of the day, if she didn't show up, well, I got my 400 bucks and I just get to go home early. So that was the deal. And so no, I ran a credit card again for 400 bucks and um, she did not show up again. So it was like four times, yeah. Wow. So she finally showed up and I think I got about $1,600 off her. And some of you might be thinking, oh, you should have refunded her that some of that when she finally showed up. No, no, no. She was an exotic dancer here in Vegas, and she made no bones about it, um, and she made a lot of money. She talked about the money she made. And the, and the reason she didn't show up a lot is because, you know, she got herself, you know, a whale. That's what, that's what you know, sometimes they call them, is whales, like someone with a lot of money. So, you know, she's not going to keep her brow procedure with me if in the course of her work day, she came acro across a client or a customer that was going to spend a lot of money, you know, with her or on her. Um, sometimes they took her shopping, you know, and, and whatnot. So, hey, I, I get it. You know, I, I, I get it. I'm going to be second fiddle to that. I, I'm fine with that. So we did work out a really good deal. So it worked out fine. And like I said, this was our deal for many, 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 many years until she, she moved. Uh, about five years ago so you know if you have clients like that you know you know just works work something out out with them because she was a nice girl I did I did enjoy when she finally did show up I enjoyed her and imagine the stories that she had I mean she had fantastic stories so she was super interesting um so those are just something to think about lots of things to think about you know uh, before the client really even gets to the procedure with you you know front desk callbacks deposit no deposit um lots of things to figure out before the client even really gets to the procedure so when they do come into your studio finally either for a consultation or to get the procedure done when they first walk into your studio or your procedure room like what are they met with what, how did you decorate your studio or your room? How's it decorated? You know, what's it look like? Is it um, appealing to everyone, the young and the older client? Is it appealing to everyone? Um, I, th I think like an entrepreneur and I personally want to be appealing to every single client, uh, no matter their age or where they come from or what their hobbies are, what they're into or what they're not into, I want to be appealing to everyone. So a lot of thought went into how I decorated uh, my studio and my procedure room. It, I think it's important, for me, it's important to stay authentic to who I am. Um, and I've got to like my studio. It's got to be my style. It's got to be something when I walk in, yeah, this is me. This is cool. But I, it, it also has to be appealing to other people. S some people don't agree with me um, and, and think that their studios or their procedure rooms should be um, completely genuine and authentic to them and and their style. And that's okay too if that's how you choose to go. But I, I think if, let's for instance, let's say like you're super gothic and, um, or into heavy metal and, 
you know, you like black walls and um, like bats and like butterflies on insect pens. And you just got this little, like a darker uh, way of uh, decorating, this darker kind of look. Um, and you want to do your studio that way. I think that's totally fine. But I also, I wonder if that, it's not probably going to be appealing to the conservative person, and it's probably not going to be appealing to the older client. Do you think you can lose clients, Olivia? You guys, do you think you could actually lose clients or turn clients turn clients off because of decor like yeah, that? Yeah, I feel like some clients might feel uncomfortable. I think so too. I agree with you. I think some clients might feel uncomfortable. We had a situation when Amber worked here, and um, I don't think she'll she would mind me telling this story, but we had a, a client come in, and she was one of the plastic surgeons at Refer uh, Girls Inc. Uh, Center, and she was in the lobby, and she had a consultation with Amber. And Amber was just walking out a client and was walking her to the front desk. I was sitting in the lobby with Amber's next appointment, the consultation that I'm talking about. And I was sitting there chatting with her and she looked up and she saw Amber. She saw Amber's bright red hair and Amber's tattooed. And she said to me, I hope that's not the girl that I'm consulting with. And I said, well, why, why would you say that? Look at her. And I said, the, the tattoos and the hair? Yeah. Yeah, that's just not my cup of tea. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, that is who you're, that is the artist you're consulting with. And so um, it bothered me. I didn't quite know what to say. Uh, I excused myself and I, and I followed Amber back into her room and I told her what that client said and I said and you know Amber I said I'm tattooed as well you know I have a piercing in my lip I'm tattooed I said and so that may have happened to me and without you know me knowing I've never had anybody you know verbally say that to me but who knows I could have done some consultations and they decided not to book because of my tattoos or because of my piercings um and I asked Amber, you know, how do you want to, you know, handle this? Do you want to just go out and bring her in for a consult and win her over? Or do you, do you, you know, do you want to decline? And she took a second and she said, no, I'm just going to act like you didn't tell me and I'm going to bring her in. And I said, okay, I like that. And I said, give me a minute. So I went back in the lobby and I sat with her. And I explained to her, uh, you know, I said, hey, you know, doctor, da, 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 you know, sent you here for a really good reason. I said, because he trusts me and he trusts all the artists here. I go, and you're consulting with Amber. She may have red hair, bright red hair and tattoos, but she is really super skilled and talented and you're going to get amazing work. And by the time you're done your consultation and your procedure, once your time, you've spent time with her, you're going to adore her like everybody else does. And, 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 and that's all I needed to say. She, she just warmed right up and, and it was fine. But see her initial, her initial judgment because tattoos and piercing. So, you know, it can happen. So if, if you're tattooed and pierced, I mean, should you cover them up? You know, I don't think so. No. Yeah. I mean, really? It's like, mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, I really don't think so. But it is something to... It is something to consider, right? So because I'm so pierced and tattooed and I don't want to hide that, I want to be my authentic self. I want artists in my studio. I want my team in my studio to, you know, if they have tattoos, that's fine. If they're pierced, that's fine. If they want red hair, green hair, purple hair, that's fine. We've had it all. Um, I want, I think, I think self-expression like that, um, you know, makes a human really happy. And it feels good to be able to express yourself, your, your true self. So that's why I wear scrubs. That's why I like my team in black scrubs. We wear professional attire to balance out 
the tattoos, the piercings, the colorful hair. So, and, and I think, and I, so I think that's a fair compromise. That's how we do it in my studio. And it seems to work. And I haven't really had anybody bitch about having to wear scrubs. Um, so I can tell you when I first started, like my first three years in PMU, I was not with Kat. I was not with Kat. And I was dressing in jeans, ripped at the knee, a wife beater. <laughs> and and back then I was really into cowboy boots. <laughs> so I would have like boot bottom, ripped faded jeans with cowboy boots and wife beaters, Hanes wife beaters, you know, because they were like a six pack for like 10 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and so if you got ink on them, it was like, okay, it was like a $2 tank top or a dollar fifty back then. But, um, and I thought I looked really super cool, you know, and yeah, I like it, liked it. I thought I had a great look. And then Kat came into the picture. And once, once she knew she, she had me, um, yeah, she mentioned my attire and that, um, it wasn't very professional and because I'm all tattooed and pierced and, that that you know that I should consider wearing scrubs and and I and and I took her advice and I've been in scrubs ever since so so there so you know client experience and unfortunately clients people you know humans we judge I think all of us at you know from time to time maybe without even knowing it uh, judge you know we we look at people places things and and we get these ideas you know we we judge and and judging is not always um you know a, a bad thing but i just think it's human nature so uh you know consider how your studio looks you want to make i think it's important that it's appealing to all clients what about the music that you listen to you know, if you like heavy metal, if you like, you know, rap, um, you know, thing, you know, heavy, heavy rock, you know, th that kind of music is not appealing to everybody. A lot of people can't listen to heavy metal or, you know, hard rap or um, punk music or goth music. Um, it, it doesn't sound like music to them. You know, it almost, it's, um, it can be painful, especially to the older generation. So you want to make sure that you've, if you do play music, which we do here at the studio, we have music in the lobby. I personally can't tattoo without music. So I make playlists, um, for, uh, the studio, the lobby. I make playlists for my procedure room and I try to make sure all the music on there is nothing too heavy. And there's something for everyone. I put on, you know, some like vintage country. We put on some Elvis. We put on some, you know, dance music, some disco, some rock, the Eagles, um, lot, lots of different, so even some of the new music, some, some of, you know, some, some of the Biebs, you know, music, <laughs> um, Alanis Morissette. I mean, we just, I just make a nice playlist with some current music out now all the way back to some songs from the 50s and everything in between. And I just want to make sure that there's something on there for everyone and there's nothing, even if it's not their forte, maybe you got a client that doesn't like country, but it's not like offensive to their eardrum. It's not going to be like, you know, painful for them to listen to it. So keep that in mind. Are you going to offer coffee, water, snacks in your lobby to your clients? something to think about you know it is an added expense uh when i first opened the studio you know i had this vision and this idea of having this great little snack station and water we brought in a coffee pot with all these coffees and in this three-tier kind of super cool tray and we put you know individually wrapped cookies and all this stuff i just did all this stuff because it was my first studio and we had this whole area and I can tell you it made a mess. Most people didn't drink the coffee. Um, most people didn't eat the snacks. If it, and, and if they did, it was crumbs all over the place. You'd find the wrappers in between the cushions. Um, the snacks would expire before they get all eaten up. So what I have found is 
really what clients want when they come in? Water. Right? Mm-hmm. You sit up at the front in the front lobby a lot, Olivia, don't you think? Just water. Yeah. I, we we har- hardly anybody went for the coffee, tea, or the snack. So although it's a great idea, great intention, and it looks really cool, and, you know, it's 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 part of what you think might be a great client experience, right? The client walks into a really decorated, pretty studio with, you know, music they like going. Oh, and there's a snack station. they got coffee and, you know, individually wrapped uh, pepperidge cookies. Um, but, but, it, but it was a waste. It was a waste of money. So uh, for me anyway, maybe there's some of you that offer all that and it's not. Your clients, you know, drink and gobble it all right up. Uh, but here they did not. I find all they really want is water. So we buy small little bottles of water. We have a cute little pink fridge in the lobby and we keep um, little mini bottles of water in our lobby. We offer one to everybody that, that comes in. So, yeah, and, and back to what you wear. Scrubs, are you wearing your regular clothes? If you're wearing your clothes, regular clothes, are you showing cleavage? Right? That's one of Kat's things. Like, she wanted to make sure no one, like, showed, like, a lot of cleavage. Maybe a little line, but not a lot of cleavage. Um, when she goes into other offices and she's greeted with someone with like a lot of cleavage, like she doesn't like it. She thinks it's not professional. What do you guys think about that? Olivia, you ran a department store out here and you had a lot of employees under you, Mm -hmm. right? So I think you're, you're a good one to, what do you think about that? Um, employees showing like a lot of cleavage. Or the studio owner. What if I came in with a lot of cleavage? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you'd I laugh. Think... You guys, first of all, you guys would laugh. Yeah, you'd say, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> Where'd you go buy those? <laughs> we would take a lot of reels for sure. <laughs> yeah, that would make some good reels. Yeah. I know. I have no cleavage. <laughs> I know. You could drive a bus through my boobs. Yeah. Uh, plenty of room. That's that's all right though. I, I I like it that way. I like it that way. It makes me look really tomboy. I like it that way. I like it that way. Cat likes it that way. So I'm good with it. I'm good. I'm good with. I'm good with it. But, you know, we've got some artists here that we're blessed. <laughs> Do you know? And so, we don't allow them to show a lot of cleavage. You know, what do you think about that? I would agree because I mean, when with the movement, sometimes you don't realize that you might be showing more than you would want to. Like a little piece of areola can peep yeah, out. Yeah, if you're like bending down yeah. or anything. Yeah, I've seen that before. <laughs> I've seen that. You see a little piece of areola like peeping out, and you're like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> like it's like someone needs to tell her. Yeah. <laughs> you, know? you know, I should probably tell her. <laughs> and I don't think I did <laughs> because, you know. Oh my goodness! Okay, so <laughs> look, but if you look, if you're if you're wearing if you if you're showing lots of cleavage, it's okay. I mean, you know, these are all just things to think about. Maybe these are things that no one's ever brought up before. There's just things to think about. That's all, you know, uh, for the client experience. And I I don't I I think there's a lot of women that don't enjoy looking at a lot of cleavage. It can make them uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, you know, everybody loves Raymond. You know, when Marie walked in and saw Deborah's cleavage that one day, you know, it was, it was horrible. You know, she was, yeah, she couldn't even look. I'm an everybody loves Raymond fan. Uh, but anyway, closed toed shoes. Well, that should be a part of the dress code if you're doing PMU. Maybe if you're a hairdresser as well, because you sharp tools, you know, scissors and, you know, sometimes you're even, um, doing a little bit of barber work, you know, what if you drop that, you know, you could lose a toe. Um, so, but I think for, uh, PMU, it's definitely, um, a sanitary thing. You want to be in closed toes shoes. They look professional. Personally, I don't like looking at other people's toes, but I do. So like when I'm at the grocery store and I'm like behind a man, or an older man, or and I, I just have this feeling 
if I look down, <laughs> they're going to have gnarly toes. I just have this <laughs> feeling. So you just look at people's toes? <laughs> I'll look. <laughs> Even though I know. I'm like, I'm standing behind them. I'm looking at the back of the head, the neck, the teeth, <laughs> the shirt. Be a man or woman, I just got this feeling if my eyes keep going downwards, I know I'm going to see some gnarly toes. But I can't help it. I look down, and there they are. They're gnarly. And, and I keep looking at them. And I don't know why, because I'm not enjoying looking at them, but I keep looking. I don't know <laughs> why it is. But, um, yeah, so closed-toed shoes, especially in a permanent makeup studio, closed-toed shoes. And we already talked about your hair, you know, whether it can be funky, different colors. I think that's fun and that's fine, a hundred percent, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but when you're doing permanent makeup, per se, or facials or any uh, laser, you know, should it be tied back, you know, a hundred percent? Um, especially if you're dealing with anything that is like puncturing the skin, opening up skin in any way, you definitely want to make sure that your hair is tied back, at least for the procedure. You can, you know, undo it in between appointments, but at least for the procedure, you want to make sure your hair is, uh, tied back. Nails, should they be like super long? If you're doing PMU, you know that that's up for debate i mean there's a lot of a lot of people i've seen this debate on facebook many many a time over the years and there's a lot of people that think absolutely no the nails need to be you know short and trim because of you know our hands are in gloves and you know we're holding machines and you know whatnot i, I don't know what their reasons are um but i've got some personal friends that do pmu that got long nails i mean they go get their manis you know every two weeks and they keep long nails and they do pmu just fine and the nails fit in the gloves so i guess i don't really have an opinion i guess i guess that's a like a personal choice um so when it comes to your look just like when it comes to the look of your studio and your procedure room your space i do think it's important to be authentic in that it represents you, who you are as a person while maintaining um, some professional boundaries, you know, at the same time, trying to balance the two. That's my philosophy for my own personal business. And it's worked rather, rather, rather well for me. When I was decorating this studio, you know, I tend to like that rock and roll kind of look, a little edgy, you know, I like metal. Um, I do like black and pink, you know, my, you know, when I was a little kid growing up, you know, my pink was, my, my bedroom was bright pink, the same pink as, you know, the girls ink pink. <clears throat> um, even though I was a tomboy, even though like, I think growing up, like I wanted to be a boy, to be be honest with you, but I still liked pink. That was always my favorite color. So, you know, we did the studio in pink and I wanted a lot more. We do have some metal. We got some metal lockers. We got some metal. uh, But then Kat kind of put in her personal uh, um, feminine touch with the chandeliers and, you know, with some soft touches and stuff like that. So it ends up being like a really nice balance. Um, so yeah, so you know we spend a lot of time at our studios. We spend just as maybe not just as much, but we spend sometimes almost as much time in our studios or at work as we do home. You know, so um, I think it. Need, I think it's important that that you feel good and you feel comfortable and you feel at home there. Um, so to keep a loyal clientele. I think it's important that they love you just as much as they love your work, right? I think if the client falls in love with you as well as your work, more likely they're going to be loyal. Because if you think about it, especially nowadays, you know, there's lots of people doing really good work, really great work. So what's going to keep that client with you if you're not the only one in your area doing 
beautiful brows or beautiful hair or, you know, whatever it is you do. If there's multiple choices on uh, technicians that are doing beautiful work. And that difference is you. You. If that client forms a connection with you, that becomes really powerful, really super powerful. So that's always been my goal. And, you know, I got that little tidbit from Tony Robbins many, 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 many years ago um, when CDs were a thing. I, I could not afford his CDs, but I had a friend who had his CDs, had his CDs, and she um, copied them for me and gave them to me as a gift one time. And I listened, listened to him like crazy. And that's one of the big nuggets that really struck me from, um, from his, his lecture was that it's just as important for the client to fall in love with you, who you are, as it is your work or the service you're providing. And it made sense to me. It made perfect sense to me. So from that day forward, I made it a point to be really personal with my clients while maintaining a professional boundary as well. I'm somebody 22 years in business and... I have never gone to dinner with a client. I've never done anything recreational with a client um, outside of work. I've always kept that professional boundary. But when they're in my studio, in the procedure room with me, then I make it very personable. And one thing that I do is I want to know about them. So I ask them questions. Do they have kids? Um, are there kids in school? Usually people like talking about their kids. I like the client to do a lot of, t to talk, to do most of the talking. I want to learn about them. I ask about their dogs. Um, I'll even have them, well, let me see. Let me see a picture of your dog. And then I, and then I have dogs. So then that's something I can really bond with on a client. I can show them pictures of my dogs and then we can bond on the dog, the dog thing, the animal thing. Um, I'll ask them about music. Do you like, do you like this playlist? Do you like this song? Do you like my music? And usually they say yes. And we'll start talking about music. You know, if it's someone of a certain age, they're probably going to like Elvis Presley. Or uh, if they're dressed a certain way, then they're probably country. Then I'll, I'll mention Loretta Lynn and Tammy Wynette and, you know, if, if they're younger, then I'll mention, you know, musicians that are from, you know, a, a more modern area. And I'll connect with them on music. Um, I like to play little TV games and, and, uh, and test them on, like, different uh, TV sitcoms. So there's lots of things that you can connect with on your client, with, with your clients that are really fun. Um, ask them if they're going on any trips coming up soon. And, and it just creates like a bond and it allows you to connect. When I walk the client out, I always ask them if I can hug them goodbye. I like to hug, but I understand some people don't like, uh, that, that personal closeness. So I always do ask, I tell them I'm a hugger. Um, can I hug you goodbye? And I've never had anybody say no, I don't think once in 22 years. So I always hug my clients goodbye. And when I go back into my room, I write my notes. And in my notes are a lot of those personal tidbits that I learned about that client. I will write down their dog's name, their kid's name, where their kids went to college. If they mention they're going to Hawaii in, you know, in two months, I'll write that on my notes. I'll write lots of different things. If there's a certain artist or actress that they really, really like, I'll write that down. And then if there's any news that pops up about that artist or um, actor, uh, in the meantime, that's something that I, I can talk to them about on their next appointment. And it's very impressive, you guys, when your client does come in, you know, a year, two years, three years later, and you get out your notes, you get out your client form on them, 
and you're refreshing yourself and you'll you'll and the memories come back you can almost because of the notes i write i can almost put myself back and remember my time with them because when you when you do a lot of clients sometimes it's hard to remember um like in detail your your time with them but i'll refresh my notes and all the conversations start to you know come back and then i'll ask them hey how's your dog muffy <laughs> or how's 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 david your son and how's college going up at you know you know dartmouth or whatever how was your how was your tr- did you ever make it out to that trip to hawaii and they're really impressed that you remember You remember their dog's name. You remember their kid's name. You remember these details. And oftentimes they'll say, wow, I'm impressed. I can't remember that. And my comeback is always, well, you're my favorite client. (laughs) And they love that. Big smile ends up on their face. And that's usually when I'll, you know, like a little pat on the shoulder or give them a little half hug, things like that. I've always been that way with my clients. And it's always worked really, really well for me. Um, aftercare kits, chocolate, and a nice little note in a nice bag. That's another way to provide a really good client experience. You know, your aftercare kit, it can be as simple. If you're not a hugger, if it's hard for you to be personal, personable with, um, clients or or people that you don't know. And I understand that there are people out there like that. They're, they're not, you know, it's more difficult for them to be, you know, personable. Um, maybe they're a little drier. So what about an aftercare kit? Maybe you, you know, fluff up your aftercare kit, you know, put a nice chocolate in there, uh, buy some nice little bags that everything goes in. Of course, your aftercare um, instructions, your aftercare bomb, and then type up a thank you and then put down, you know, write something really super sweet and send it off to Vistaprint. You can get, what, Willow, 100 cards for... For tw- 100 cards for 20 bucks. Sit down and just write something. You know, I want to thank you for blah, 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 blah. And when they get home, they open it up, you know, and there's this great little note from you. You know, and there's a chocolate. And, you know, it can be, it can be as simple as that. Do you do follow-up calls, emails or messages after the procedure to check on them? You know, I did back in the day for a period of time (laughs) and then I stopped and I probably stopped because it was just me and it was too hard for me god it was hard enough for me to keep up with the incoming calls and booking clients so imagine me trying to then do follow-up calls and follow-up messages just to check in to see how they're healing so I didn't keep that up but it is it it does add to the client experience You know, I have some colleagues that do do that. You know, they do follow up um, with an email or a message just to check in on their healing. I have some clients that, uh, colleagues that say, oh, hell no. Every time I tried to follow up with a client, you know, it was, well, the scab's this, you know, the color's this, it's lighter than, (laughs) it opened up a whole can of worms. So, but just something to consider. It's all about, the client experience, right? Because that's what's going to separate you from the rest. Because as I mentioned, there's a lot of lot of artists out there in all the different cities, all the different areas of the world doing great work. Our industry has more talent and skill today now than ever before, which is great for the industry. It's great for all of us. It really, truly is. But it can also, you know, but it's, it is, you know, it can cause you to have to work a little bit harder to stand out and uh, keep clients loyal to you and not jumping around artist to artist to artist. And the way to do that is um, enhancing your client experience the client's experience and and having them just find you absolutely adorable and falling in love with you. Is the client always right? No. (laughs) Wow, I didn't even have to ask you your opinion on that one, Olivia. (laughs) I mean, I worked in retail for like 10 years, so. Did your company, we won't mention the company, but did your company have the policy 
the client customer is always right. Yes. They did. Yeah, they did. So then, but you personally did not have no. that philosophy, your own personal philosophy. That was not your philosophy. No. And how many not. employees did you have under you? How many were you managing? Um, at one time, I had about 25 to 30. Holy moly. Okay. I got you I got you two and Jesus Christ I couldn't even imagine <laughs> <laughs> that's enough <laughs> no I'm just kidding 25 or 30 can you imagine that Willow <laughs> holy hell that sounds like too much. you'd never bash editing again would you yeah. no way yeah <laughs> yeah editing <laughs> oh god editing could never be ever be as difficult as 25 or 30 employees so okay then how did you balance that if you have a company that's clients always right customers always right but that's your your, not your own personal philosophy but you have people under you that maybe what you have to have have a sit down with because a client a customer complained about them i mean so usually like face to face i would tell the client that they're right the customer only because like if they call corporate, corporate ends up siding with them. So yeah. there's no point in me arguing with them or telling them that they're wrong. So I would just face to face be like, yeah, you're right and fix whatever the issue is. But then I would sit the employee down and talk to them as to why like we have to do that. You would tell them. But you would I don't necessarily the, agree. <laughs> so you tell the employee, I lied. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> I just lied. <laughs> My fingers were crossed behind my back. (laughs) Forget what I told them. It was all a lie. They were wrong. You were right. No, I get it. And we, you know, and you know my philosophy, right? Kat and I are steadfast in our philosophy that the client or the customer is not always right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and... And I'm somebody that will go out of my way. You know, you're a big part of, both of you are a big part of customer service, even though your, you know, your your major, uh, what do I want to call it, thing you do here, (laughs) 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 is like marketing, you know, and the Instagram and the marketing and creating, and, you know, we do all this really fun stuff. But both of you also play a role in customer marketing on some level or at some points throughout, you know, the week. And you see some of the stuff that comes in, either through clients, you know, or customers, you know, the stores, um, the store. Because we have client that we do PMU on, and we also have the store, you know, that services the industry. So we have, the, you know, the, the, the customer, um, the consumer customer. And so, yeah, the client and, and, and customer is, is certainly not always right. And sometimes they're downright mean and mm-hmm. abusive. Yeah, we've experienced that. And, and it's sad, you know. Um, but we do, we do go out of our way. I, I think Kat and I and I think everybody in here, everybody in here is nice. You, t- you two girls are nice. You're genuinely nice. I see that you want to please and help clients out and make things right. I'm I'm that way, Kat's that way. You know, out in the real world, we're that kind of people. Um, I think everybody here is. So we do try to make things right. We want the client and the customer happy. We will give discounts, we'll send a freebie, we'll do the, we try to make things right. And I think it's important to do that, to go into an issue with a client or a customer with the intention of first apologizing that that happened or that was their experience even if they're wrong you still want to apologize Mm -hmm. that this was their experience you know i'm sorry you this was your experience and then try to make it right to the best of your ability but then when the customer or the client gets mean then i've i've got my employees back I just do. I mean, we have a really strict policy at the front desk, and we just had to tell, remind Katrina, explain to Katrina, because she had a customer that was really, really rude to her. 
on the phone and Kat stepped in and told her, you know, you're really upset right now and it's difficult having a conversation when you're yelling. So give, you know, when you calm down, call us back and we'll work this out. So our policy is never to stay in a conversation with someone that's yelling, threatening, screaming, demeaning, and just being an asshole. What is a conversation going to do? It's just going to upset my front desk girl. It's just going to upset one of you. It's going to upset me. It's going to upset. And, and, and the client or the customer is already upset and just getting more upset. So zip, hang up, get, get out of that phone call, get out of that conversation um, in a professional way. And we have all the verbiage written up front for our girls to cite. And then we do invite them to call back when they've calmed down so we can work it out and I think that's a good way to get out of that situation without mm -hmm. just like hanging up on you you really want to just hang up on them or just say you know sometimes you want to just say man can you just stop you're being a dick <laughs> you know I'm trying yeah. to help you but you're just being a dick and you want to hang up sometimes you just want to say that because no matter what you do the person is just nothing you do or say is making this person happy but you can't call someone a dick you know, and just hang up. That's not the professional thing to do. So you have to kind of, you, you just got to wiggle out of it and uh, in a professional way it, and get out of it. You just do in a professional way. That's how I feel. Do you like that policy? I do. <laughs> I think it's a good policy. Yeah. Because I think the first year we had the studio, we didn't really know how to get out of those situations. And we would sit there and just let a client or a customer scream at us about something, you know? And a lot of times, you guys, it, it, was, it wasn't even our fault. It was beyond our control. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, if it's something that we have control over, we will fix it, you know? But some of the complaints, some of the anger comes from things we have no control my goodness yeah and you i've know? even seen like clients call back and apologize yes we have had that happen we have had that happen and we and i i think sometimes when you've got an angry client and they're screaming at you i don't think you stay on the phone with them but i also don't think you hang up i don't think you sit there and you take it i think it's abusive it's ver mm -hmm. it's a form of verbal abuse and no one should have to be subject to that I don't want anybody on my team being subject to that. Um, so I think when you're able to like, hey, 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 stop, stop, and you get them to stop yelling and they stop, look, you're upset and you're screaming at me and this is not going to get us anywhere. I'm, I'm, we're going to hang up and I want you to calm down. And if and when you calm down, you can give me a call back and we'll work this out. Kat's very good at it and she'll hang up. And then sometimes, yeah, they call back and they apologize. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, do you think maybe Olivia in the heat of the moment, they don't realize how much they're yelling or what they sound like on the other end? Yeah. And I feel like sometimes some people have really bad days like we all do. And then you just take it out on somebody that exactly. doesn't even deserve yeah. it. It, right? Mm -hmm. Right. But just because, and I agree, we never know what someone's going through. That's why we should all have compassion, right? You never knew. That person could have just lost her cat the day before. Sorry, Willow. I said, I used cats as an example. <laughs> <laughs> Willow's a cat freak. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, I can't say dog. I got Samson and Delilah right outside the door. I mean, you know, Samson, dog. What do you mean dog? But you know what I mean. I mean, they could have lost their pet, their beloved mm -hmm. pet the day before. Or, you know, something. Something bad could have happened, you know. But still, just because, just, be, just because that doesn't give you license to then be angry and, and project, you know, your bad day or whatever you're going through on someone else. It mm -hmm. just doesn't because then it can domino. Now you just affected another person. You just really ruined like that moment for them. You really affected them. You, you caused them anxiety. You caused them, um, it, that could ruin someone's whole day if, if they're super sensitive. 
you know, like a 10 minute phone call getting screamed at that could make that person, the whole day was ruined. Do you know what I mean? Or the whole rest of the night, they can't get it out of their head. They keep thinking about, you know, the client yelling at them or threatening them or whatnot. So I don't know. So I, I just think, you know, don't engage. Um, don't engage and wiggle out and um, advise the client you're happy to discuss this with them when they're calm and they can discuss it without yelling because nothing gets resolved when someone's yelling so all right how long we've been going an hour and 20 minutes oh my god okay oh my gosh i'm sorry we gotta go well i had lots more on my sheet so maybe we'll do a part two all right the client experience the client experience something to think about all right you guys thank you for hanging out with me today summer's coming i'm so excited are we excited 115 mm -hmm. degree days mm -mm. our summer's not like everybody else's summer no you're excited willow I'm very excited. okay why are you so excited oh is I there like cause the sun. Yo, you do like the sun. Yeah, are I love you, the sun are you happier during the summer oh 100 really 100 okay so you'll be a happy editor this summer. <laughs> very happy editor. So we should do all our filming during the summer months. Yeah. We'll see about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure we'll have some more projects. <laughs> oh, we are, Olivia. I got to do another eyeliner. <laughs> we have to get the video perfect. I, we, we're doing another eyeliner. Yeah. One, maybe two. Just depends. But summer's coming, Willow. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> And, and we've got this on tape. We do. <laughs> we do. You Let's said it. it out. <laughs> no, no, you're going to clip off this clip. Yeah, we're going to use it. We're going to use this clip as a <laughs> promo <laughs> yeah. clip. Anytime you start to um, complain, we're just going to play it. What yeah, did you say? Exactly. <laughs> well, you saw her over sitting yeah. over those couple of days, and I was sitting right beside her, like, no, get this out, get that. I was, I was nitpicking everything. No, go back. Put the video, put the bullet point here. No, go back, go back up. No, not there. Go back here. Yeah, right there, right there. Okay, can you nip that out? Well, if I did, well, can you? Can you nip it out? <laughs> and then I could sense Willow. I could see her frustration just like, mm. I pat her on the back. I go, <laughs> this is why I'm taking you out for sushi and cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> I told Cat Willow hates me right now. <laughs> well, Kerr, got done. Good team, Willow. We're but we got through it without. No know, one cried. No one yelled. No one cried. No one yelled. We didn't even. We were not. We didn't even get smart assy with each other. No, we really. I had one in the back pocket, ready to ready to pull out, <laughs> just in case. Just in case you pulled one out. I had one. I had one. I want to hear it. <laughs> well, summer's coming, so, you know, I can lock it in the closet until fall. Yeah, I won't need one because summer's coming. and She's so happy in the summer. So she's going to be a happy editor. I can't wait. Can't wait. Can't wait. All right. Thank you, guys. And look, this is what I want to leave you guys with. Start where you are. Use what you have. Do what you can. That's what I want to leave you with. Have a good one, and we will see you next time on A Tatter Effect. <laughs> <laughs>